The research and education networking community is an incredible ecosystem of networks all working together to provide excellent network services for researchers. Having that much bandwidth is really critical to data intensive science. We need the capacity and yet there's always those new things that you're trying to get to. Before it was 100 megabits was good enough. Now you want a gigabit ethernet, then you want 10 gig, then you want 100 gigs. And so there's this constant pressure. That's always going to be the challenge of technology. So it's never enough. In the beginning, Internet2 was put together to construct a network so that researchers could collaborate across the country between different universities. Internet2 was a response to the commercialization of the Internet. Universities still needed research and education level connectivity, and the commercial internet wasn't really what the universities needed to support their researchers. We couldn't get the same level of work done that we had before. It was time for us to create this national backbone, which would serve higher education re research exclusively. So we came together as a like community. Then also allowing hospitals, libraries, K through 12 schools to be able to connect to the Internet 2 backbone has been tremendously valuable to those organizations. We had 155 megabit per second connection, and now we have over 100 gigabit. So then if you fast forward to about 2009, we had the BTOP program. It's added all kinds of capacity and it adds community anchors too. BTOP allowed us to expand the footprint of the network and where it went and who it connected. As the network becomes better, more reliable, then we can put things into the cloud. What has also come to the forefront is trust and identity. You see these collaborations that are not bounded by regional bounds or national bounds. No matter where a researcher is in the world, that they'd be able to access an experimental facility, an observational facility, a compute resource, or a collaborator. For them to be able to seamlessly use a resource without having to re-identify themselves or re-establish trust is a huge enabler. It's hard to be an innovator by yourself, so you need to grow this community. Some of these big discoveries are really contingent on these global collaborations of scientists, and without really robust cyber infrastructure, the software programs and the hardware around it, there's no way that these discoveries could be made. The next evolutionary leap is in looking at this service infrastructure. Look at the service that's being enabled through networking, compute, storage, it's all coming together now. The fundamental sharing of research data is going to be as open as it can be because that's what's going to drive the innovations we need to sustain the research we're doing. Clearly the paradigm is shifting. This model is evolving. It is in our DNA to look over the horizon. What's coming next? How is this ecosystem going to evolve and change? How do we translate science data requirements into network services that researchers can use? How do we continue to offer the service at the same time, reinvent the model, and create a new workforce that is able to operate in this new model? If you were unconstrained, what would you do? What would you do differently? How would you change not only the digital technologies you're using, but how would you change things in your everyday life? Are we investing everything that we need to? Those are tough questions that we're going to have to answer.